Backstage Creative, the podcast that focuses on the people who work behind the scenes of theater. My name is Krista Copper, and I am a musician. One of the things that I think is so remarkable about theater is that it takes so many different people with a, a myriad of skills in order to create a live production. One of the things that gives me so much joy when I'm uh, doing a theater gig is, is watching that the creative process and watching um, how different people solve problems and how and watching a show come together during tech week and um, you know the privilege of being able to play a show night after night and and being a part you know being a small part of such a massive team I think it's such a, a great industry to be in and I think a big part of that is because of of the people I started this podcast because I wanted to know more about what all of these people were doing, (laughs) you know, sitting in a rehearsal uh, during tech week and watching all these different people try to solve a problem. And I just wondered, you know, what their job was like and and what the responsibilities were. And so I thought, well, why don't I start a podcast? I I had kind of looked around to see if there's um, something like this and I couldn't really find anything. And so I just started emailing friends and then expanded to other people that I that I have never met and I've benefited so much from just talking with people and hearing their background story and their design process or um, how they solve problems or how they take care of themselves when they're not at work and it's helped me uh, appreciate the theater industry even more and it's given me a greater respect for the people that I work with. Today is my conversation with Sean McDaniel. Sean is a drummer currently working with Frozen on Broadway. Well, technically not currently because we're in the middle of the coronavirus shutdown. You know, Broadway's closed right now, so it's currently is I guess a relative term. But he is uh, also um, responsible for the developing the the drum books for shows like Book of Mormon, Nine to Five, Spam a Lot, Hamilton. I was so excited for this conversation. Nine to five and Spam a Lot are two of my top like four shows. I, I think Spam a Lot is just hilarious. And I think nine to five is, is such a timely show. That's still the story is and the issues that those women face are still so relevant today. And so it was an honor to sit down and talk to Sean. I'm so grateful that he took the time to do that. Before we get started with this interview, I recently created a Facebook page for this podcast. I, I don't, I'm not sure why it took me so long <laughs> to do this, but uh, if you could head on over to Facebook and, and like the page, um, that way you will stay up to date when I release new episodes so you won't miss one. So here we go. Here's my conversation with drummer Sean McDaniel. So I think it'd be fun to start with, uh, you've worked on a lot of uh, shows like developing the books for shows. Um mm-hmm. Take us through that process. Like someone contacts you and says, hey, uh, we're getting the show around and we need a drummer. What are the next steps that happen? Um, So usually, like, um, I guess I'll use Book of Mormon as an example. Um, One day I got a call from Bobby Lopez, the composer, and he said they were putting together a top secret reading and he didn't tell me too much about it. They didn't know if it was going to be an animated movie or a musical or what it was. So he called me first and then I talked to the music director, Stephen Aremus, after that, who we've worked together a a lot. So he calls me for stuff sometimes too. But this one came first from Bobby and then from Stephen. And then they wanted to to get me ready for the first reading. Uh, You know, a reading is like usually piano and drums and a small cast and maybe a director just reading through the script and singing through the songs. And for Book of Mormon, the first one of those was only about a, a 20 minute piece, I guess. And it had like an animated backdrop because they thought it might be a cartoon but they wanted to hear it with live actors so bobby and steven sent me some demos which are like you know simplified versions of the song sometimes just a composer singing on with the piano or sometimes they have a full track and so since these were book of mormon they had some south park voices on them which was really funny and (laughs) some of them had some um you know synth and some drums so you can get an idea of the songs so that when you go into the reading you you know the idea of of what they want you to play so you can get in the ballpark, but sometimes you're just reading along with the piano chart or by ear or a lead sheet, or sometimes just someone improvising at the piano and you're just playing. But the ones with the demos were the bigger songs. So I had an idea of how to play those, but they still develop once you're in the room because you're hearing the dialogue in the middle and you're hearing different singers and the forms can change. So it happens all different, all different ways, but 
it's definitely so fun to get to be a part of that process at the very beginning. How long does that process take? I mean, I'm sure it varies from show to show. So for Book of Mormon, we did five workshops over three years. And the first one, I think, might have been a week. The second one was probably two weeks. And then we did a few that were four to six weeks long. And sometimes these workshops will have a performance at the end or two performances. Sometimes they let you invite people. Sometimes they're just for the writers. But yeah, most shows have many different readings and workshops. And so they just keep refining it over time. Uh, but that first Mormon one was, was about a week. So we practiced for four days. And then on the fifth day, we had an audience there just to hear it. And then the longer ones, sometimes they'll, they'll have the cast memorize their lines and they'll have some dancing and maybe even some costumes. Usually the first readings, they're standing at music stands with sheet music in front of them. So then are you like, are you notating all the drum parts? Is someone, are you like recording them and, and then someone else transcribes them? Usually I'm reading off a of piano vocal music. So I try to just me remember everything I play. Maybe I'll write some notes there if someone tells me something specific to play. But a lot of times I'm just making it up. So I just try to, you know, in, in these workshops, you play everything so many times that you can just remember what you played the last time and keep refining it. And um, the way it gets written down is, is different on every show. Sometimes the arranger will come in and rewrite what you've done. Or a lot of times they'll want you to play what you've already played. And so they might transcribe it or someone will record it and transcribe it later. It just, it depends on the show, but um, drums are so different than anybody else in the orchestra because we've mostly developed our parts in the early stages of the show and they don't want to change too much. Mm -hmm. Is it kind of a weird thought, like thinking about all of the people who have played shows that you, you're the original drummer on? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think about that a lot, like a show like Spam a Lot or Nine to Five or, or Book of Mormon, how they're done so many times around the world now. and once Spam a Lot and Nine to Five got released as um, amateur shows, you know, every high school or community theater can do them. So I'll see sometimes people chatting on these Facebook groups for musical theater drummers about what sounds I use or or how to how to play a certain part. It's it's really cool to know that all that stuff is getting played all around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done Nine to Five and Spam a Lot, and those are two of my favorite shows. So thank you oh, wow. for your work on those. <laughs> <laughs> those those were those were really fun ones. Obviously, uh, Spamalot was my first Broadway show to be the first the original drummer on. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. <laughs> so, what does the rehearsal process look like um, for a show that you're not developing, but someone calls you and says, "Hey, we need a drummer for the show on Broadway." What does that rehearsal process look like when everything's fully formed? So, the only time that I've done that that kind of thing was on um, La Cage a Faux, the, the revival with Kelsey Grammer and Douglas Hodge from London, mm -hmm. because um, that was the only show I've done that came from London. And, and so we didn't develop it here. So I was thinking, wow, I'm not going to be in rehearsals all the time developing this stuff for years and years. So I need to come in and sound like I have. So what I did was I got a pit recording of the London production with the, from the London pit. And I just started transcribing everything the drummer did so that because I knew that the star of the show had also done it over there Doug Hodge so I didn't want him to be shocked when he heard different drums here so I started out by just copying everything that guy did and writing it all down and listening a bunch of times so that on the first rehearsal it wouldn't look like I was sight reading you know with the band because they're probably getting their parts for the first time that day it worked out well and, and then from those rehearsals I was able to kind of develop it into my own kind of sound a little bit but I didn't stray too far from it, but I added my own uh, little touches in there. And um, so with that show, we probably had like three days of orchestra rehearsals and then we're in the theater doing tech for maybe a week and then we start a preview. So it's really accelerated when you don't develop a show. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, pre-show routines or rituals that you do to help you kind of get in the headspace to perform? Not really. I mean, it's usually this, that's the socializing time usually. So we're like, I usually get to the show by 7.30 and then I'll have a few minutes to, I'll check my electronics and check my tuning of all the drums and maybe warm up a little bit if I haven't played during the day. But it's usually the time for saying hi to people and, and talking like in the locker room or may, maybe even eating dinner or something like that. I'd, I don't usually have to do too much to warm up, maybe just get my hands moving a little bit. I imagine when we come back after the uh, quarantine we're gonna have to do a little bit of um, touch-up rehearsals and warming up a little bit do you ever uh, get nervous before you perform I don't get nervous that much anymore maybe if it's something really big like live tv or um, a big recording session maybe I'll get a little nervous but I just try to to not let it show you know always thinking about 
how nerves can make you play faster sometimes. So if you just think about that all the time, remember, okay, keep everything sounding laid back as as much as you can. That it usually will help help that. Mm-hmm. I found too that like the older you get, the like nerves you just kind of even if they're there, you're just kind of like, oh, this is normal, or oh, I've I've been here before, it's fine. <laughs> right. I guess just the more experience you have, the more it just becomes second nature, and you're just used to performing. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bass player and tempo, like memorizing tempos, that's always, you know, that's a big part of my job and the drummer's job, really everyone in the pit's job, but it's specifically like the rhythm section. How do you, how do you remember consistent tempos? Is that something that's like you just kind of do at any point in your career um, or in your training? Did you have to develop that like tempo recall? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, a lot of shows now, you know, have, have click tracks, so it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. But when you're in a reading or a workshop in an early stage, you're probably not going to have that. So you just have to know all the tempos. And like I said before, you, you do this song so many times that you just get it in your body and everybody kind of gravitates to the tempo that you're doing in the rehearsal room. And so when you get the orchestra later, everyone's like, oh, that felt faster or slower in the, in the rehearsal room. So you try to just play it how you've been playing it. But in terms of like jumping from one section to the next, it, it just comes from repetition and like Usually I'll, I'll try to lead the whole room into that new tempo if I can. You know, we don't, I'll just get used to it. But if I'm playing a, a gig, a non-Broadway gig that has tempos of songs I don't know, I usually try to think of another song that has the same tempo. And when I'm counting it off, I'll sing that song in my head. So I usually just like jot a, a popular song at the top of the tune to remind me of the tempo. The other thing I do is I have my iPad charts that I read on gigs that have charts. And I'll have the tempo of the song flashing on the page so I can see it to count it off. Oh, nice. <laughs> Playing consistently night after night after night. How do you how do you do that? I guess it's just like that's the nature of a Broadway musician. I guess you know that it's not the time for improvising. We have little things we can do like me and the bass player or percussionist or guitar will at Frozen. We'll go back and forth. If they do something, I might throw in something extra. But for the most part, I'm playing the same show every night. And just trying to make it perfect every night. That's always my goal is to make it sound like a, a recording session. So I just try to make sure everything is perfect with the click and everything feels good. Not having any mistakes or any weird sounds. Make sure all the drums are hit consistently. It's so much more than just reading the notes to try to get a consistent performance. Like you want every drum and cymbal to sound you know, perfect every time you hit them and everything to line up. Doing that every night, even if, if a show's been running for years, it's still a challenge to, to get that perfect every night. How do you take care of yourself, like mentally, physically, emotionally, so that you can go in night after night and do a show? In the long runs I've done, I usually try to do about six shows a week. I think if you do eight shows a week, too many weeks in a row, you might get a little bit tired or burnt out. I try to keep it fresh by by doing six a week and maybe staying home on the matinees and hanging out with my son. Or if I have a busy week with a lot of gigs, I'll try to pick one day that week to take off so I have a, a full day off. Because a lot of times they plan gigs on Mondays when there's, when there's no Broadway shows. So then you don't have a single day off in a week. And so that can get a little tiring. But so I usually just, I want to make sure I have a little bit of free time every week. And I usually go to my studio and just play for fun or do recordings or, you know, just hang out at home. It's nice to have a little break every once in a while. And of course, right now we're having a very extended break and I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I feel that too. How do you find balance in your life you know you've mentioned like taking a day off but are there any other things you know balance between like family time and um, your Broadway shows and the other projects that you're working on I think it's very important to have the family time you know I just don't want to I don't want to miss any of these years while my son is young so the good thing about working at night is that I can usually take him to school in the morning and pick him up in the afternoon and we can play together at the park and have a long time before I even have to leave for my show so those days are great but the days where I have work during the day outside of Broadway, it can be a, a long day. So I'll just try to, I'll still get to get up in the morning and take him to school and everything and have that morning time. And then maybe not get to see him till the next day. So that's always sad. But then I'll try to find a day that week where I can just take off and, you know, I'll, I'll lose the money from a show, but at least I'll get to have a family day. And if there's another gig that week, it'll make up for the lost money. At least I found like balance is something that's never stable. Like it's always something you have to try to be intentional about, right? Like balance, yeah. whatever balance looks like, it's always kind of in flux. (laughs) Yeah. You have to plan it. Like 
sometimes we'll plan like a, a night out or, or a dinner date or something. You have to put it on the calendar far in advance. And in, in the old days when we were subbing and doing a lot more freelancing, we would just take every gig that came. So I, I think when you're younger, you don't really have time or you don't have the um, luxury of having a balance because you want to just be doing everything. Now that, that we're older and more established, we can take some nights off and have a little free time. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, could you take us through your background, where you're from, school you went to, and how you got to Broadway? Okay, well, I grew up in several different places, mostly Texas and Oklahoma, and I started playing drums around seven or eight, just started playing drums by ear, and then moved on to guitar and piano and songwriting and singing, and I just kind of, you know, I wanted to be a rock star, so I was just kind of writing songs and and like doing concerts where I would record myself playing all the instruments and I'd get up and sing with it. And then um, I would play drums and bands. And then in, in middle school, I started playing in the school band and then doing all the choir stuff and playing in, in rock bands and doing all the musicals. And I was playing in a, um, in a funk band in I guess my freshman year of high school. And the singer of the band, she let me borrow her Les Mis Broadway soundtrack, which um, I hadn't heard at the time. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, I really like this. And mm -hmm. I was like, how do I find a way to combine what I'm doing now with, with Broadway music? I just started, I started playing along with those kind of albums in addition to the jazz and rock stuff I was doing. And I tried to um, play all the musicals I could in high school. So I played the ones at my school and at the other high schools in town. When I went to college, I went to University of North Texas, which is a large school for drummers. So I had a lot of competition there, which was great because it, kind of prepares you for New York because there are so many other people there. And while I was there, I was just trying to, to play in as many um, ensembles as I could so that I'd be ready for New York. And plus, I was trying to do all the musicals in the community theaters and the school. After my freshman year at North Texas, I was looking for a summer job, and I decided to be an intern at the, the theater where all the national tours come through, which was called the Dallas Summer Musicals. Uh, every summer during college, I would work there just like as an intern getting coffee for people. And I met a lot of Broadway musicians and actors and stage managers. And over that time, I guess I probably worked on, you know, probably 20 tours. So I met a lot of people so that when I moved to New York, I had some people I could talk to and, and contact. You know, it was, it was the days before Facebook. So, you know, I'd have to call people on the phone or I'd have to write letters to people. It was a different kind of scene back then. Mm-hmm. But I made enough connections so that when I came to New York for grad school, which was at NYU for graduate musical theater writing, while I was in school for composition, I was starting to play some drum gigs on the side. And so by the time I got my master's in the composition thing from the musical theater writing, I was already playing enough gigs and it just kind of snowballed. And, and um, then I made it to Broadway, I guess, because of the um, connections I had made. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for like networking and making connections? I think it's, it's so different now with the internet because, you know, it, it just makes the world so much smaller. And I hear from people all the time on Facebook or Instagram. I think it's just, it's the same, it's the same mentality as before. You just have to be, you know, nice to everybody and you don't want to be presumptuous and you don't want to be cocky or um, entitled. You know, when you approach someone, you, you, you don't want to tell them that you want to sub for them right away. You just, maybe you want to learn from them or you want to get to know they're playing, you know, you have to work your way up. It's tough to get started here. Right? I realize that. And so it's definitely good to meet all the people who are doing what you want to do. There's just ways to do it that isn't, you know, you don't want to annoy anybody. So that that's tough to find that balance. Yeah. Like you don't want to approach people like with an laying an expectation on them of like, how can you help me type of thing? Right. But I, I do let people watch me usually. Uh, at, at Frozen, I'll let people come sit in the pit with me, and it's a good way for people to get to see what Broadway is like and hear me play. And the other thing some people do is they'll they'll find out when I have gigs outside of the show, and they'll maybe come to see a band I'm in play or something like that, and then I can talk to them there. Talk about subbing. So when you are subbing, or you know, as when you're looking for subs for the shows that you're in, what what are qualities of a good sub? Yeah, subbing is a whole thing. That's so that's how I got started on Broadway. That's how most people did. Right after I finished grad school, I was able to start subbing on a Broadway show called Aida, mm -hmm. which was um, a Disney show by Elton John. And the drummer was Gary Seligson, and he gave me my, my big break. So I owe everything to him. 
and that shows it was my first one subbing. I basically just took a whole month and memorized the entire show. And I set up my studio exactly like the pit so I could practice everything that he had in the pit. And I just came in and tried to play my best and, and just, you know, really, I knew it cold. So, and nothing could, you know, not, if I was nervous or whatever, nothing could, could make me not have a, a, a flawless show. That was my goal. After that, I started to get to sub on some other shows. I guess altogether, I probably subbed on 13 shows. But at one time, I guess I subbed on 11 at the same time. So that was the craziest time where I was playing <laughs> a different show every night. In terms of subs now that I'm looking for, it's always word of mouth from other musicians. Most people think that you get work from people that play your instrument. But a lot of times it's from bass players will tell me what drummers they like to play with or, or um, you know, piano players. And so you're always trying to make everybody in the pit happy. You need people that are versatile because usually these Broadway shows have lots of different kinds of music. So you want someone that's had Broadway experience. It's hard to bring someone into to one of these shows that hasn't ever played on Broadway before. So I usually need people that have done it before on another show and have lots of experience with different kinds of music. And usually people that have experience with music technology like electronics and Ableton and things like that so that they're not scared of running the click tracks. So it's a lot of factors you have to figure in. They'll usually come watch you a few times and they'll record the show and they can take as long as they want to, to learn it, depending on your time frame. They could use, they could take a whole month or whatever. And then they'll usually get their first show and you don't usually get to rehearse before you come in. You just have to come in and play the show with the full orchestra and the full of cast. And that first performance is your audition. And the conductor will tell me if I can have them back or not. And it's very rare that someone doesn't get to come back after their first show. But usually they'll get a few notes from the conductor afterwards, and then they come back. And I usually try to get people three shows right in a row next to each other so that they can get comfortable. And then I work them into the rotation for the run. Yeah, I can't imagine the pressure of subbing on Broadway. So I'm not based in New York. I'm based in Kansas City. But when I've subbed, it's like the most adrenaline inducing thing that you can do because it's oh yeah uh, like it's, I can't even imagine for drums especially because you're the backbone of everything but um, I think subbing is so much fun it's so terrifying <laughs> it's very scary but it's it's so rewarding when when at the end of the show somebody will say hey I didn't even know the other person was gone because uh-huh. you, you know if you've done your homework and you've copied them so much that they think that the, the regular player was there and it's nice to have the variety, too, because when you're a sub, you get to play a different show all the time. But it is hard because it's like, you know, it's really a lot of pressure, especially on the drums. And a lot of these shows were running the click tracks and the Ableton and things like that. Mm-hmm. What are qualities of a good pit ensemble? I think for me, I, I'm always trying to have the best feel that I can. When you have a band that all feels that together, it makes it so much more fun. And at Frozen, we have such a great rhythm section. And we're always thinking about the feel. You don't want the click to make you feel like you're playing robotically. So we try to lay back on the click as much as we can. I'm always trying to think of that in my head. I don't know how much of it comes out, but I just think that's so important. And and so having the whole band locked together with the click and with the groove, that's, that's the most important thing for me. Mm-hmm. What about in terms of people like what makes a what makes a pit if you walk into a, a rehearsal and you're like oh yeah I get to play with this guy I'm so excited or what are what characteristics do they have well now it's, it's changed a lot where it seems like so many people are nicer now and I feel like in the old days there'd be just you know the mean New York style people that <laughs> people were always scared of and now it's just nobody wants to work with those people anymore so that the nicer people are getting hired and the contractors who put together these bands want to put together a good group of personalities that will work well together. And at Frozen, we're so lucky. It's a 22-piece band, which is really large for Broadway, but everybody is so fun to be around that we just have a great time all together. And it, it's harder when it's such a large band because you don't talk to everybody every day, but no matter who I talk to in the band, we always have a great conversation going. The more you play in New York, you start to see certain people over and over on gigs. And so you'll be like, oh yeah, I get to play with them. And it could be because of their playing, you just love playing with them because of their sound and their feel. But it also could be people that you love hanging out with. And so what's really cool is when you find people that you love hanging out with and love playing with, and then you can put together like the perfect band. Mm-hmm. I love that the older way of the mean person, I love that that's going away. <laughs> yeah, it's just, 
Yeah, it's, it's a lot different. I mean, we're seeing more diversity, obviously, and just people are, are kinder and, you know, you don't want to get stuck in a long run with someone that's no fun to be around. Yeah, for sure. Or someone who's obnoxious, you know, does like weird oh, yeah. things in the pit that just annoy you. <laughs> yeah, and that stuff gets around. Like the community is so small that everyone has stories about that kind of stuff and it gets back to the contractors and those people probably won't get hired as much. So mm -hmm. yeah, you always have to be on your best behavior. Yeah. <laughs> so you've worked with people like Alex Lacamoire, Lynn Manuel Miranda. Are there any common characteristics of those of people who are I don't like the word famous, but really well known in the theater world? Is there any like common um, characteristic that you see in those people? Yeah, I mean it's, it's usually like with with someone like Alex, it's it's his level of musicality is so high that whenever he's in the room, he just makes everybody want to play better and everybody wants to give him the best product they can. And so there's, there's definitely that he just brings such quality to every project and it, it makes everyone up their game when they're in the room with them. With someone like Len, when he comes in the room, he, no matter how famous he's gotten, he always makes you feel like you're the most important person in the room. And he just um, makes you feel good when you talk to him. And I noticed that with, with people like David Hyde Pierce, when he was in spam a lot, people throughout the years who were just, you think they're going to be super famous, but then they end up being the nicest people in the world. And it's, you're, it's, you're always like, Oh, that's why they're so famous. Everybody wants to work with them because they're just so fun to be around. And they make you feel so good. And they're usually really talented too. Yeah. I love that because so much of our job, you know, it's more than just being good at what you do. That's obviously very important, but there's, you know, the whole relational aspect because we are all working so closely together and there's so many of us trying to create one product that, yeah, there, there is a, a people element that I think sometimes, um, especially younger people in the career don't always realize that there's a relational element that you have to address when you're on the job oh, yeah. too. Yeah. Everything is about relationships. I met Alex Lockamore when I first moved to town, I was subbing on a show called bad boy that he was the conductor for. And then we came across each other again later on Wicked. And so that's a relationship that goes back to 2001. And Stephen Aremus, I met him on Wicked, which was 2003. So these relationships, they, they're, they're so long. And you never know who, you, who is going to affect you later in life that you meet early in your career. That's why it's so important to just you know be nice to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, who have been some of your major uh, musical influences? When I was younger, it was people like, um, you know, like hard rock bands like Poison and Motley Crue, so like Ricky Rocket or Tommy Lee. But then I got into people like Dave Weckl and, and fusion type people. And as I got into college, I got more into jazz with people like Tony Williams and, and Brian Blade and then Steve Gadd and Vinny and all those people. You know, it all it all kind of adds up to, to what your sound is going to be when you're, when you're a grown up, I guess. So I was listening to a lot of jazz and rock and some Broadway albums. Later on, I got into people like Chris Dave and Matt Chamberlain and Keith Carlock. Uh, so they're some of the more contemporary people. Whenever I'm doing a show, I try to find, if there's if it's possible, to, like the one common thread of a drum sound that I'm going for the most. For Frozen, it was Matt Chamberlain because he played the movie soundtrack of Frozen. And he's one of my favorites and one of the best studio drummers ever. So I was trying to get his sound as much as I could or use him as an inspiration for everything I play in Frozen. And when I did the show Violet, it had kind of a, like, um, almost rootsy vibe. So I was able to use my Brian Blade influence on that. So I used drums and cymbals and sticks that had a Brian Blade vibe. So I'm always thinking of that, like trying to find an outside influence that can work in, in the Broadway uh, style that I'm playing. Oh, I love that. W was there anything that you wish you would have known before you started working on Broadway, like anything you wish we would have been taught in school or that your private instructors would have told you? I th I think, I don't know if it's oh, the time I was in school or maybe it's happening more now, but we didn't do a lot of stuff with click tracks when I was in school. And, mm -hmm. you know, 90% of my gigs now and recordings are, are with a click. And so just having that practice with the click helps so much. And just being able to bury the click, which means like, if you're playing a groove, every time you hit, it's it's so on with the click that you don't hear the click anymore. And so I feel like younger people should really spend a lot of time doing that and also trying to make the music feel good with the click so that, so that you're not like controlled by the click. But yeah, that was something I wish I'd had more experience with. 
another thing I learned when I moved to New York was was about feel. I mean, we always wanted things to feel good in college, but um, when you're playing actual gigs with, you know, veteran New York musicians, they always want it to feel good. And, and you realize they want everything to feel laid back. And it's so hard to, to do that when you're sight reading or when you're nervous. And so it just, you know, anytime you can practice having a laid back feel so that it just comes second nature when you're, when you start to play professional gigs, I think that's really important. And any of the technology stuff like Ableton and Pro Tools and Logic, all of that stuff is going to help you with, with gigs. Mm-hmm. Do you have a, a daily practice routine? Not really. It's It's been funny since I've been stuck in my apartment and all I have are my V drums. I've been practicing technical things that I haven't played for a long time. Usually my practice routine is if I have time to go to my studio, it'll be like practicing with recordings, playing along practicing recording like just getting good sounds and just kind of playing for fun because I don't have that many times where I can just sit and improvise at the drums so that's usually what I'm doing there but yeah if if I was going to set up a practice routine I would spend a lot of time playing with records and playing with a click and recording myself with a click and recording and just you know recording yourself is the most important thing because the machines don't lie and so when you hear it played back you're like oh that's what I sound like and there are so many things like even now if I record myself playing Frozen, I'll hear things that I did not think I was doing. And it's very eye-opening. So that's it's really important to record yourself a lot. Yeah, when I was in school and my teacher, you know, said, you need to start recording yourself. And I did. And I was, the first few times I was mortified by what I heard. <laughs> I was like, I cannot believe this is what it sounds like. <laughs> oh, yeah. It still happens to me a lot. Like just, you know, with my V drums in the apartment this week, I've been recording a little bit and trying to play some more complicated grooves and I hear them back and, and it sounds terrible. And I'm like, how do I fix that? And so I've just, you know, just getting a chance to dissect my playing a little bit has been cool. How do you grow or how do you work to get better at what you do? I think it just, it just comes from gig to gig. And now I, I find like when I'm, when I get hired to do a new gig or learn a, a set of songs for someone, I just really want to, not let them down and I just really want to bring as much as I can so I think it's all about preparation and the the people I work with who expect that like they don't want to have to tell you oh you got to do this here you got to do this here they want you to come in knowing everything already and I think that's who gets hired the most is when the people in charge realize they don't have to do any extra work with you because you're going to come in and, and have everything already you're going to know everything already you're going to know the tempos and and the styles so that's so important. So from, from gig to gig, I'm always trying to make sure I'm as prepared for the gig as I was on the last one and that I can play all this stuff. And if there's something that's going to be challenging, maybe I do have to sit and shed for a little bit before I go in or just play with, with the tracks a lot to get used to the tempos. I have found myself growing just because I guess it comes with maturity from, from living here a long time. Or if I listen to older recordings, I hear things I tried to do that I didn't like, but yeah, you always want to be improving. And I just just want to make sure everything always sounds as flawless as I, as I can get. Mm-hmm. If you can't think of any right off the bat, that's fine. But have there been any funny like mishaps during a show or rehearsal? Oh, yeah, there's there's a lot of those. One of the best, though, was when we were doing nine to five in L.A., we had a really complicated set that had elevators and tracks and all kinds of things. And it happened, it broke a few times. One time it broke during a preview. So there was a full audience there and we had to stop the show. But then Dolly Parton was in the house, you know, because she wrote the show and she came up on stage and she talked to the audience and then she actually sang. And so we got to play with her while she sang nine to five and I will always love you. So that was such a cool moment to get to play with her, you know, besides playing the songs from the show, like actually playing her songs while she sang in front of an audience. That was a really cool moment. And it, it wouldn't have happened if the set hadn't broken down. So she's saying why they were fixing the set. Is that why she came? Yeah. Up? Yeah. She was just nice. killing time and uh, <laughs> telling stories and stuff. And then of course the audience loved it. They got like a bonus show. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to think if there were some other funny moments. I mean, it's never fun to stop a show, but it happens. It's usually for technical things. There was one time we were doing frozen in Denver. The show counts off with a computerized one two three four and when the show started it sounded sped up kind of like the chipmunks like one two three four 
And we're, and so me and the conductor were looking at each other and we thought, okay, maybe it'll just straighten itself out. And we kept playing and it kept getting worse and worse. And we actually had to stop the show and then reset all the computers and we started again. Everything was fine. Sometimes you don't even know where these computer glitches come from. It's exciting sometimes. I'm trying to think if there's a funny one. I'll have to think about that. But yeah, it's always, it's scary to stop the show. Definitely. Yeah, that's crazy. Has that happened like on Broadway before for you? Yeah. Um, there, there have been times where, where stuff is broken. You've had to pause the show for a little bit. It happened pretty recently on Frozen. Um, I can't remember what caused it, but we had to sit there for a little bit. And then usually they just have to reset some computer somewhere and then we go back. Yeah, I guess there's there's so many elements that go into like one show that, I mean, it's bound to happen no matter how prepared or how um, great of oh, equipment. Yeah. And, people and that's have. It's the fun part of live theater. Like sometimes an actor might forget a line. I remember one time I, I was doing a show where I think an actor fell asleep on the side of the stage. And so <laughs> they weren't out for their entrance. So the other actors were just kind of making stuff up, waiting for them. <laughs> so that stuff's always fun, especially when you know it's not anybody's fault, you know, in the band. You can laugh at a little bit more, I guess. But, um, you know, it's always it's always fun to hear different stuff on stage. It keeps us, you know, entertained. Yeah, when I did a production of Spam a lot, the director gave the actors quite a bit of license to, you know, just take the the goofiness of the show and run with it. And yeah, just every night that show was different. And like a lot of times it was funny. Sometimes it got a little carried away of like, uh, okay, where's our cue for when we need to start playing? Right. But <laughs> yeah, Josh Gad used to do that at Mormon. He would have some hilarious improv moments there. <laughs> Talk to us about uh, what it was like working on Hamilton. So that was really cool. Um, my first experience with it was doing a concert at Lincoln Center for Lynn. It was the songbook series, I think. So what it was, was it was half songs he's been writing for Hamilton and half songs that he had that had inspired him to write Hamilton. So we played a lot of um, popular hip hop songs that he was into, which was really cool because I always love getting to play or listen to hip hop with live instruments because so many of it so much of it is recorded with you know loops and tracks and samples so when you have a live band playing it it has so much more energy so mm -hmm. it was really cool to play those songs and then also play the Hamilton songs as they were at the time which at the time it was called Hamilton mixtape and it was it was kind of like a um like a song cycle almost so we played those there and it got a really good response and then they did a few workshops that didn't have drums they would either use tracks or just piano I think they did one at Vassar and they did one maybe in, in the city as well. So those didn't have drums. I came on again for like maybe the third workshop. And so that was like a smaller size band, but still we had strings and they had costumes and sets and the whole show was finished. And that was produced by the public theater, which is who moved it to their commercial run at the public theater. And then that's how they got to Broadway. And so I was only there to play that run because Alex and Steven had discussed letting me take a break from Book of Mormon so I could start Hamilton there since I developed it with them. And then we always knew that Andres would take over, who was the drummer for In the Heights. So he came down to the public and learned it from me and then took it to Broadway. Nice. Uh, I like advice questions. Um, so what advice would you give, let's say like a young musician who, you know, has the Broadway lights in their eyes and, you know, wants to make it to the top and um, be professional. What advice would you give them? I would say just um, listen to and play as much different music as you can. You know, take any gig that you're offered, no matter how much it pays, play with everybody you can, any kind of music, because all of that is going to add up to your sound. and you know, it's going to expand what you have to offer when you get a Broadway gig or when you're asked to play a Broadway show because because of all the varieties in the shows. And the thing I see a lot of is that since Broadway music is usually trying to sound like other kinds of music, they want that music to be played authentically. So if they can hire someone who has experience playing that music, it's going to make the show sound even better. So I would just say play as much as you can and listen to as much as you can so that you can, if someone says a name of someone you can be like oh I can do that or you've heard enough to know how to imitate that style and the other thing is just being a kind person and being someone that everybody wants to work with so just always being positive always being on time not asking for stuff just 
showing up and letting your playing speak for itself, I think is the most important thing. If you do that enough, it, your name is going to get around the city or whatever city you live in, and people are going to want to ask to play with you. The music for the Backstage Creative was improvised and performed by Ian Leroy, and the logo was designed by Zach Rimbold.